Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? I can, thank you. May we please call Mr. Pegler? In a moment. Um, I just wanted to put on record the fact that due to my um, concern that my IT system was breaking down just before lunch, I omitted to um, thank Mr. Inwood for his witness statement and for his oral evidence. I would like to put on record my thanks to him for providing the statement and oral evidence. Now you can call the witness, Ms. Price. Thank you, sir. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Could you confirm your full name, please, Mr. Pegler? Yeah, it's Thomas Abraham Pegler. You should have in front of you a hard copy of a witness statement in your name, dated the 12th of May, 2023. Do you have that? Uh, yes. And if you turn to page 20 of that statement, please. Yes. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? I do, and it's my signature. Are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. For the purposes of the transcript, the URN is WITN 089801000. Thank you for coming to the inquiry to assist it with its work and for providing the witness statement that you have. As you know, I will be asking questions on behalf of the inquiry. Today, I'm going to be asking you about issues which arise in phase four of the inquiry, focusing on the policy, procedure, and practice of the post office in relation to the action taken by the post office against post office employees following discovery of apparent shortfalls in branch accounts. You were with the post office for 31 years, I think, after you joined in 1984, is that right? That's correct. Initially, you joined as a postman? Yes. You became a counter clerk in 1986? Yes. Uh, a supply chain manager in 1986? Um, Apologies, I think we must have the wrong date there. Forgive me. You moved across to counters as a counter clerk in 1986. That's correct, yes. And you were subsequently promoted to assistant and then branch manager? Yes. And an Echo Plus implementation manager. Could you please explain what Echo Plus was? Yeah, Echo Plus was a forerunner to the Horizon system uh, employed solely in Crown offices. Um, it wasn't networked, it was a standalone, but every counter position had a terminal, and I think there was a back office processor. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it was operated via three and a half inch floppy disks, which went to product and branch accounting weekly in Chesterfield, which contained all of the branches' accounts. And what was your role in relation to this system? Uh, it was basically uh, there as a support to branch managers and their staff when ECHO was implemented, uh, which basically ran uh, two weeks before the office. I would take delivery, run diagnostics, um, be in branch while they perform their final written manual cash account, um, having already uh, installed all the positions, and then I'd be there for a week until they completed their first electronic balance and there as a support and trainer, and then move on to the next branch. And what were the differences between the Echo Plus system deployed in Crown offices before Horizon was introduced? So what was the difference between the Echo Plus system and the Horizon system? Uh, the main difference, I think, were better hardware with touchscreens, which we didn't have, 
Um, so a difference in the keyboard, a difference in the hardware, the fact that it was all networked as well and down the line meant that there was no need for floppy disks. Can you recall when Horizon was rolled out in Crown offices? It must have been front-ended. Um, there was probably, I think there was a Thames Valley project of sorts, so it could well have been the late 90s, early 2000s. You were seconded, I think, to the head office project team in 1997, is that right? That's correct, yes. What was the focus of your work when you were part of this team? Uh, the focus of that was mainly an organisation review, looking at all aspects of the business, um, from territorial, regional, uh, and head office and back office support as well. Uh, so I was primarily involved as a support to the very senior managers on that team and a librarian collating all documentation about how the, how the business was run. And you were a head office based crown service and efficiency manager from around 1998, is that right? That's correct, yes. And you held roles which focused solely on the operation of the crown network from this point until you left the post office in 2015. Yes, all aspects of operational work other than sales. The Crown Network covered Crown Office branches, otherwise known as directly managed branches, is that right? Yes. And those who worked in Crown Office branches were employed under contracts of employment by the post office, weren't they? They were, yes in contrast to sub-postmasters who were not employed by the post office but were agents and op operated branches pursuant to a contract for services. Correct, yes. Were you ever involved in the operation of branches outside of the Crown work network? Not really. Um, when the business uh, decision was to look at the Crown office and how profitable they were, one of the options was franchising. So I did become involved in supporting the franchises as they occurred, which often meant um, being on site when an office was, cl was closing or converting to a franchise and then being there as a bit of a support for the franchise office as it started running. This could have been an independent franchise or a company franchise, for example, uh, WH Smiths. But as time went on, there was more bespoke support for how franchise offices were brought in. Turning please to post office losses and gains policy. You say in your statement to the inquiry that crown net losses had always been an area of concern over the years when you worked for the post office, is that right? Yes, yes, it's, it was seen as a manageable um, line on a, on a P&L. Could we have on screen, please, POL 3083982? This is a document entitled Losses in the Crown Network. It appears from its contents to date to late 2007 or early 2008. Does that sound about right? It sounds about right, yes. You say in your statement that you remember assisting your manager pulling some of the data together for this document. Yes. Under background, this document explains as follows. There has been considerable concern in the Crown Network due to the recent trend in counter losses and post shop sh post shrinkage, together totaling 2.5 million for all Crown offices. Can you just explain for us what post-shop shrinkage was? Yeah, sure. Um, when the business wanted to get into the retail area, um, there were very few post-shops, which were front of house, um, a retail area, not behind screens, and shrinkage was effectively um, stock going missing, uh, either coming in or going out from the suppliers, stock going out the front door uh, from loss and theft, um, accounting errors, uh, basically any, anything where 
they're deemed to be a loss in the retail stock side of the post shop. There is a table below setting out net losses reported for offices remaining in the Crown network. And there's a number given for that, 373 offices. Yes. We can see the counter loss stood at 1.393 million in 2003, stayed at similar levels in 2004 and 2005, and then went up by 53% to 2.048 million in 2006, and up 25% on that in 2007, with a figure of 1.740 million. Pausing there, was there any discussion at this time of the possible reasons for the losses in the Crown Office network? From what I remember, the biggest impact and focus on the figures was that the business wanted to move to a retail base and a financial specialist base. And I'm not sure when we partnered with the Bank of Ireland, but a lot of managers were coming in for externally and wouldn't necessarily know the operational um, processes in order to manage um, the counter. Now, simplistically, and from my point of view, when I went to training, uh, A, we were told, don't think of cash as cash, it's just an item of stock, and B, always take the money first. Um, and simplistically, my belief and the, and the belief of people in the team was that the basics of conducting a transaction um, taking the money or the, the payment was being missed off. Um, that's a very simplistic view to take, I know, but the, the, the culture of the business was trying to turn to get more profit and get back to profitability from financial product sales. This document assists with the policy which was in place from 1999, so about halfway down there, Starting in 1999, it says this. In 1999, a loss policy was developed to advise on the controls required at the post office counter following the introduction of multi-user tills in the Crown Office network. Guidance was provided to improve security of stock, cash and equipment, and user log-on IDs. Branch manager responsibilities were also defined and clear instructions given to improve awareness of loss performance at branch and individual level. The need for balance and supervisory surprise, SNAP, stock checks, were reiterated, reiterated as well as capturing loss and gains data in order to deploy the escalation process agreed at the time, i.e. three and three losses over 20 pounds, six and six losses over 20 pounds, and nine and nine losses over 20 pounds resulting in interviews with staff. However, despite the introduction of a national policy document, it was not consistently deployed due to a number of factors. A number of reasons are then set out for that, and the conclusion is set out over the page, please, about a third of the way down the page. And it says, due to the recent poor loss performance and trend over recent years, it has been decided that action should be taken to address future losses in the Crown Office network. You refer in your statement at paragraph 18 to the silo way of working in the 80s and 90s. Can you just explain what you meant by that? Uh, yeah, I mean, early on when I joined, um, departments were very sort of insular and they kept to themselves um, and there didn't seem to be much collaboration around at the time um, and I think I said in my statement we, we got better at that. Um, obviously when I went to head office in, in the 90s the view at head office um, differed around the retail line and when I say the retail line I mean directly managed branches like Crown, sub offices and franchises. Uh, my view is that we were there to support the front line so branch managers and sub postmasters had, had a big enough job uh, if you factor in the customer care uh, elements. So we were very, very much as a support. Um, and the, the business developed and uh, that further. By the time I'd left, they, they had um, 
sort of pipeline initiatives where we were looking at if we did this at head office, how would it impact the retail line? And looking at timing of events and things like that, which would never have happened in the 80s or 90s. Was this silo way of working something which the review happening at this time in 2008 was trying to address? When you say the review, was it the... So this document here yep. um, is discussing actions that should be taken, and we'll come on to the policy document dated September 2008, which appears to result from this review and this consideration given in this document. Um, and I'm asking in relation to the silo way of working, mm. whether that was something that this review and the new policy in September 2008 was intended to address. Um, I think it was addressed before then, um, probably in, in pre-reviews like sales and service reviews, um, SCS reviews, probably from the late 90s onwards. Um, but I think this, this review was really instigated around the actual lost performance, but at the same time trying to make the management of losses and gains seen as a potential training could be a training issue, not just focused purely on the punitive side of things. A new mandatory losses and gains policy in the Crown Office Network was introduced in September 2008. Could we have that on screen, please? It's POL 308075. You addressed this document at paragraph four of your witness statement to the inquiry, and you say you recall reviewing this document at the time. Yeah. Can you just explain what you mean by reviewing? Uh, yeah, there was a, a document in place, um, and I can't remember, it would have been a similar title, um, because when I first went to head office, there, there was a document that covered the management of losses and gains, and periodically, I was asked in my position to review that document um, as other impacts, for example, um, shared tills, horizon coming in, uh, would impact this. So the 2008 review, um, I think, was more structured in that we had uh, more input from other stakeholders around the business. And I particularly remember uh, working closely with finance because it was all around getting ownership for branch managers uh, on their P&L and scorecards. Could we go please to page three of this document, which introduces the policy and sets out its purpose. And it reads as follows. The impact of losses in the Crown Office estate is having a serious effect on our ability to deliver the 3 to 11 plan to bring us back into profitability by 2011. This policy has been redesigned to provide clear and consistent guidance to Crown Office managers and their assistants as to their responsibilities for the recording, maintenance and monitoring of losses and gains. The policy will also provide Crown Office managers with a tool to be able to effectively manage losses and gains and to take appropriate measures to reduce losses. It also reiterates the security controls required to protect both the business assets as well as the individuals themselves. Finally, for the first time, the policy details a commitment to provide training and support to all Crown Office managers in how to deploy the policy and deliver on their responsibilities. Going over the page, please. Section 3 covers the annual certificate of compliance. Could you explain briefly, please, what this was? Yeah, it, it, was, um, it was a certificate that branch managers signed off yearly to say that all of the compliance elements of running a post office, and that could be security, the management of visitors to a branch, uh, fire, so fire extinguishers, um, the evacuation policy, uh, contingency planning, was all signed off. So branch managers had a duty to sign that off annually, staggered throughout the year for the branches, um, and then it was, it was posted centrally. And then about halfway down this page, section four, we have supervisory surprise checks and misbalance checks. 
What was the difference between supervisory surprise checks and misbalance checks? Uh, branch managers, from when I remembered, always had a, a duty to perform these checks. Um, not sure that they went on as declared in the policy as on a regular basis as they did uh, prior to any automation, but it was basically an element of surprise to say, ah, oh, Jeff, I'm going to check your count of stock today. Not necessarily after balance, but it could be on any day of the week which involved a branch manager effectively just doing a surprise random check. But the branch manager would record that, and then the area manager or above when they visited the branch would ask to see their record of these checks. On the other hand, a misbalance check, um, I think when I was involved in this, £30 was the set criteria. So what we said, a second pair of eyes, be it the assistant or the manager or another person in the branch should physically check the cash and stock before um, it is moved on or, or used again, uh, because sometimes a second pair of eyes could help find things. Going over the page, please, page five, that is in this document, about halfway down the page, we have in bold and underlined, the following steps are carried out when undertaking a financial audit at a Crown office and are recommended for the Crown managers to adopt when performing a stock check. And the bullet points there of steps to be taken um, include confirming the location of all cash and stock and ascertaining if the stock is an individual or multi-user stock, obtain cash declaration print for the night prior to the check and previous week's full balance snapshot or branch trading statement, daily prints and all vouchers on hand, obtain the following printouts from the Horizon system, office snapshot if user multi-user stock, if multi-user stock is in operation, stock unit snapshot for each stock if individual stock balancing is used, suspense account summary, and then reconcile stock to the snapshot printout, reconcile daily prints and vouchers on hand to the snapshot print, reconcile non-value items, M MVLs, bus passes, etc. inform colleagues of the result of the check. Then there is some further explanation in the paragraph below. The basis of control is that there is an awareness of the level of discrepancies in conjunction with any actions necessary to implement improvements protect our people where it, is, where it highlighted poor performance, including bringing disciplinary procedures to bear where applicable. And then finally on this page, the Crown Office Manager has responsibility for ensuring the approved systems for controlling losses and gains are adopted and implemented. Over the page, please. Section five towards the bottom of the page. And this addresses branch trading and explains branch trading should be undertaken in accordance with the latest branch trading booklets, which include details of balancing stock units, production of the branch trading statement, production of reports and dispatch of documents. Following the process below, prior to branch trading will help to ensure that only true losses and gains are posted to profit and loss at branch trading. Do you recall the introduction of branch trading? Very vaguely. Um, I think for, for Crowns it meant moving to a branch trading calendar, which could be a four or five week period. Um, but what we did, we, we took it uh, in the Crown network that we would still prepare a balance weekly, which would be a balance period. So effectively where this happened on a Wednesday night, we'd still do that but the main accounts would be posted monthly. Whereas I think in other parts of the network, for example, sub offices, possibly franchises or modified scale payment offices, they effectively did their balance once a month. But in Crowns, we, we, we decided we could still do a weekly balance, which would effectively declare fully the cash and stock on hand. Going over the page, please. The checks which should be conducted before posting losses or gains are set out. And scrolling a bit further down, we can see that, a bit further down please, transaction corrections are addressed. 
over the page again, please, to section six. This deals with counter loss and gains management reporting. Um, in summary, this section sets out the different steps to be taken for different levels of losses, doesn't it? Yes. So the first level of loss being five pounds to 249 pounds 99, then losses over 250 pounds. And then a bit further down the page to the bottom, losses over £2,000. Going please to page 11 of this document. This addressed the loss escalation process and trigger points. Could you please explain what the loss escalation process was? Yes, the, this had been around for many years. Um, and anything to do with losses and gains was subject to national discussion with the uh, CWU union and the CMA union for managers. Um, effectively, in the early days, and I think I said it in my statement, it was part of the personnel rules and regulations of anyone working in the post office. Um, and it had developed over the years so that if a trigger point was triggered, that individual or the people using that multi-user stock would enter in stage one. Um, and basically it'd be a wat watching brief for the manager to keep an eye um, on, on performance of the loss record uh, because they could actually end up balancing fine after that and then they would go back on uh, to start from scratch or if further losses were encountered that it could be triggered up to stage two and three and above. So I think the first stage there is quoting three losses of £30 or more in a reference period. And sitting behind this for the branch manager, I think, was a, a sheet, an Excel-based spreadsheet, where they could keep track on all of this. And we see here that the this table loss escalation process sets out the various stages. And we start with the multi-user stocks. And stage one, as you've just referred to, the performance which triggers action. And the action for stage one is informal interview with a Crown Office manager, with colleagues identified as having access to the stocks that have incurred losses to raise, to raise awareness of their performance and to reiterate the loss escalation process. Action plans should be agreed and notes taken and signed consideration given to a switch to individual balancing if appropriate at this stage. We then have stage two, three, further three losses of £30 or more over the period of three months following the stage one interview. And the action at that point is second informal interview with a Crown Office manager to review performance and agree the level of support required. Action plan agreed and notes taken and signed. Notice given to colleagues that they will switch to individual balancing by stage three if improvement is not forthcoming and switch is not appropriate at this stage two. And then finally, under, in this section, stage three, further three losses of £30 or more over the period of three months following the stage two interview. Third informal interview is the action with a Crown Office manager. Colleagues moved on to individual stocks action plan agreed and notes taken and signed. What was the reason for moving someone onto individual stocks? I think the key thing is that um, if you have an individual stock, as we operated earlier on, that was your cash and stock. It was your own responsibility. There would be no other people using that stock. Um, so in agreement, what we decided was that you couldn't take formal action where a multi-user stock was being used. Unless, for example, if you knew that somebody was serving and a major transaction came in, say, £2,000 premium bonds, and you forgot to take the money, you knew that that individual had caused that, that, that mistake. So it was seen very much that on the punitive side of things, obviously dealing with the training first, if we had to take formal action, it could only be taken where that individual had sole responsibility for cash and stock. 
We then in the table have individual stocks and stage one of that when someone is on individual stocks, three losses of £30 or more over a period of three months and the action is informal interview to raise awareness of loss performance, agree the level of support required and to reiterate the loss escalation process, action plan with notes signed. And then we see a number of stages that follow. Stage two, further losses. There's another informal interview. Stage three, we have formal interview and a number of steps taken out there, including notification that all future losses of five pounds or more will be taken into account. Again, action plan with notes signed. Stage four, at this point, you have further four losses of five pounds or more over the period of six months following the stage three interview. And here the action is formal interview with the Crown Office Manager to review performance and agree the level of support required and to reiterate the loss escalation process, reiterate the possible consequences of reaching LNG escalation stage five. Stage five, further three losses of five pounds or more over the period of six months following the stage four interview. Formal interview is the action with appropriate management level from outside of immediate Crown Office to review performance and consider disciplinary action under the conduct code. You address the loss escalation process at paragraph 16 of your statement to the inquiry. Could we have that on screen, please? It is WITN 0988010 and page 15, please, of that document. Paragraph 16 there. The loss escalation process in the Crown Network was designed to raise awareness, share best practice and monitor losses. It could also lead to the conduct code being triggered on individuals if loss performance fell outside of agreed levels. You also refer at paragraph 20 of your statement to moving away from focusing on the punitive side, and you've mentioned that again today, and instead focusing on the why, so the impact of losses on the business. From the policy document we have just looked at and these parts of your statement, it appears that the focus when it came to crown losses was on raising awareness about best practice, establishing what support an employee might need, and ultimately considering disciplinary action under the code of conduct. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, very, very much a fair assessment of, of the Crown Network. There was no mention in the September 2008 losses and gains policy that we've just looked at to any requirement for Crown Office employees to make good any losses that were discovered, is there? Uh, no. The, um, when I joined, it was 50p, plus or minus. Uh, it went to two pounds, and I think... It but if, five if I can just stop you there, in terms of my question, yep. requirement for the count, Crown Office employees to make good losses, I'm asking whether there was any reference in that policy do document that we looked at to any requirement. No requirement, so. no. no. We'll, we'll come on to the, your statement that deals with uh, what options were open to Crown Office employees in a moment. Thank you. Was there any obligation on Crown Office employees to use their own funds to cover any losses identified? And again, using the word obligation. No obligation, no. Was that something which was ever considered as part of the strategy for dealing with Crown Office losses? As far as I can remember, no. Why not? Um, basically, they're our employees, and I think it would be difficult from an HR perspective uh, to enforce that unless there was a major rewrite of the, the contract manual. But I, I don't recall it ever being a, a consideration. If we could go to page 18, please, within this statement. That top paragraph there, 
I think this is what you were referring to just a moment ago. And so just to read that out, within the Crown network, when I started, you had tolerance built into your balance, e.g. if you were plus minus 50p out on balancing, you could put in or take out the cash up to that value. This became plus minus two pounds, then plus minus five pounds over time. If Crown staff declared losses, then the losses and gains policy would be applied by the branch manager. So is what you're saying here this, that if there was a minor amount by which the till was out, they could put in up to that minor amount rather than declaring, yes. three, uh, which would trigger the policy and yes. the steps that yes. we've looked at. Certainly, you wouldn't expect to see any declared, depending on the time, you wouldn't expect to see any declared losses, for example, of less than two pounds in the Crown Network. Going back a, a page in the statement, please, towards the bottom, at paragraph 21, you deal with your understanding of the position in relation to shortfalls experienced by sub-postmasters. And you say, my understanding was that sub-postmasters had to make good any shortfalls within their accounts in line with their contract with the post office. This would mean sub-postmasters putting their own cash, putting in their own cash so that the total balance agreed with the derived figure e.g. paper-based pre-horizon, or what was held in horizon when their branch was automated. You've touched on this in your answer already, but why was this different approach adopted for sub-postmasters when compared with Crown Office employees? Um, historically, there'd always been a difference, um, going back long before I joined the business, and um, it was the differentiation between sub-postmasters are their, uh, it's their own business, they're agents of the post office, whereas the staff are directly managed by the Post Office Limited. Did anyone raise any concern ever, as far as you're aware, about the difference in approach between the two groups? No. Could we have, please, the September 2008 Crown, losses, Crown Office Losses and Gains policy back on screen, please? That's POL 3084075. And page 16 of that document, please. Towards the bottom of the page, we have the start. We will do. We have the start of section eight, entitled security compliance. Over the page, please, to section 8.2, horizon. This reads as follows. Crown office managers must ensure the following actions are taken. Need to ensure that only colleagues who are working at their offices are logged on to the horizon system. Anyone who leaves the office must be removed from the system. All colleagues must have their own user ID and must only be attached to the stock units they are operating at the time. It is not acceptable to have all users attached to a stock unit. Where possible, users not operating a stock unit should be placed into default. Passwords are sacrosanct and for each individual's pro protection. Under no circumstances should passwords be known or shared. This is vitally important, not only from a security aspect, but is a requirement under our licensing requirements for the SSA, FSA, Financial Services Authority. Crown office managers must make regular checks as to the users listed on Horizon and ensure people have the correct level of access. Minimum access requirement as per information security policy. What was the reasoning behind these mandated actions? Um, it's best practice, good housekeeping. Uh, a good example would be a reserve uh, member of staff who floated around, say, five or six offices, um, and they could potentially be attached to stock units in those five or six offices. So that element is it's all about good housekeeping. Um, we probably got input from um, the security team or the horizon team 
um, on these bullet points as well for the policy. Turning please to page 19 of this document, section 8.9. About halfway down, that's it. Suspicions. And the first bullet point here reads, if the Crown Office Manager, Deputy or any colleague has any suspicion about someone, they have a duty to report it. This can be difficult, especially if you're not sure. Please contact the MBSC in complete confidence on a number. Your information will be passed onto the investigation team who will assess the information. Your details will remain confidential. And the last bullet point there, any loss can be reported if there are suspicious circumstances, irrespective of the amount. Again, the investigation team will assess the information and a decision will be made on whether any further action is taken. What would you have considered suspicious circumstances to be? Um. It could have been a variety of things involving cash or stock, volumes of transactions. Um, one that I did come across when we did um, certain transactions was a huge increase one day, uh, which alerted the branch manager to say, something's not right here. Who do I get in touch with? So um, that would fall under that category. Would a shortfall or loss on its own have been enough to amount to suspicious circumstances for you? Potentially, yes. Um, I think the issue for me is, at the time, I was not aware of issues with Horizon. Uh, if we were, that potentially would fall under that category. We have another version of the September 2008 policy document, which you have commented on at paragraph 6, uh, 4 of your statement to the inquiry. Could we have that document on screen, please? It is POL 304076. You say in your statement that this was a version for use as an operational document for branch and area managers. What was the reason for having another version for branch and area managers? Uh, from what I remember, this, this brought out the key operational points uh, without appendices. So it was, it was basically a quick guide. Uh, the content should be exactly the same as the overall policy. Um, without all of the nest, all of the various uh, discussion points, so it was really just identified as a quick guide for branch managers, and this this I think was rolled out uh, national workshops. So we had input from branch managers and area managers when we put this document together, and we also rolled it out to the network as well. So I think it came from a branch manager or a team saying. We need something more snappier, because there's quite a lot in there. There's a lot of material. Could we go to section one of this document, please, page three? Section one here is a little different to the section one in the other version we've been looking at. In particular, it includes the actual figure for Crown Office losses in 2000 to 2007 to 2008 of 2.2 million. Do you know why this figure was not included in the other version? Uh, nope. No. So this, this document is the quick guide. Moving please to the balancing process for Crown Office branches. You say, in your, that can come down. you say in your statement to the inquiry that Crown Office branches used to balance their stock units weekly on a Wednesday evening. The office would then amalgamate and run the office balance from Thursday, sending all supporting documentation for that week in a pouch to P and BA in Chesterfield. Um, just to be clear, what does P and BA stand for? Uh, that would be product and branch accounting. 
And you say after branch trading was introduced, a full branch account statement was only required 12 times a year. Is that right? Yes. But you say that individual stock unit balancing was still taking place weekly in crowns. So there would be balance periods within a trading period. Is yes, that right? That's right. And you've said usually four to five balance periods in a trading period. Yes. In terms of what a Crown Office branch should do if there was an unexplained discrepancy when they were trying to balance, you address this at paragraph 127 of your statement. Can we have that on screen, please? WITN 0, page 12 of that statement, please. Scrolling a little further down, please. It's that last paragraph there. For colleagues working on the counter in a branch performing a balance, physical check of their cash and stock, only one option really existed, and that was to confirm figures and roll over into the next balance period or trading period. If there was a discrepancy between physical cash and stock, they could recheck themselves ask a colleague or manager to recheck. This would, of course, be time dependent and may find the error before confirming and rolling over. The branch manager may find errors next day, e.g. transfers between stock units not balancing, which rectify the original error. Depending on the value volume of the loss or gain would decide what route through the losses and gains procedure the branch manager would take. What were the repercussions of rolling over when a reason for a discrepancy had not been found? If the reasons hadn't been found, then the loss or the gain would be declared, and that would go against the users um, who were using that stock that week, or the individual, if it was an individual stock, and that loss would be posted against those individuals or that person and that would become subject for the losses and gains procedure. Was there any way for a Crown Office branch to challenge an apparent discrepancy where it was unexplained? I believe so, yes. Um, I mean, I had a team of uh, people who faced up with branch managers and regional managers. Um, when this, this process was bedded in, as I say, it was delivered via a workshop and there were various um, spreadsheets to capture loss record. Um, all of my team were ex-branch managers and I think informally they would be on the end of a phone or a visit to a branch if there were unexpected losses. They were my eyes and ears. I, I got out quite a, quite a bit myself um, but I do not recall any issues rising to me about uh, unexplained losses or gains due to the Horizon system in the Crown Network. You've explained in your statement that although Crown Office branches could be audited by the audit team or field support team as they later were, financial audits of Crown Office were few and far between under normal operation. Was the reason for that linked to the process in place whereby branch managers were obliged to conduct certain checks themselves? Yes, I think from a, a risk perspective, the audit team saw the Crown Network has been low risk purely because of the supervisory element within each branch um, and the fact that they had area managers that visited. So they were seen as low risk, which meant that they didn't get the level of audit that potentially Crowns had when I joined the business. Was there any other reason why this approach was taken to auditing Crown Office branches that you're aware of? Um, it became more um, procedural in terms of compliance, uh, the FSAs would go out. I had a team of regional support advisors who would administer, for example, the annual certificate of compliance uh, and checks like that. But the actual financial and stock control element of an audit were few and far between in the Crown Network. In 2013, there was a change, wasn't there, whereby the security team, headed by John Scott, took ownership of the losses and gains policy? Yes. 
This led to the rewriting of the mandatory losses and gains policy for the Crown, network, Crown Office network by the security team, didn't it? It did, yeah. And you addressed this at paragraphs 6.5 and 6.6 of your statement. This rewritten version of the policy was dated the 24th of April 2013. We need not display it now, but for the record, the reference for that document is POL 0008824. What did you understand the reason for this change to be? Um, at the time, my, my understanding, my assumption, uh, was that having been involved in organisation design team in the late 90s, early 2000s, that network or the retail line were deployers of policy and the actual policies should sit elsewhere at head office. That was my understanding then. Um, maybe now I've got a different view. In, in that, in 2013, it seemed that the business was looking at bringing in management of, of policy centrally. This version of the policy removed the loss ex escalation process. What was the reasoning behind that? Um, it was branch managers taking ownership of running their own offices. Um, it was a bit nanny state, if you look at the previous policies, uh, and we wanted to get to an end game that branch managers take full ownership of managing their branch, their people, their P&L, uh, and a certain amount of, uh, not, not leeway, but management of that should be given back to branch managers. And that was the view taken by security team we were working with at the time. Was it any part of the reasoning that there were, there were by this point investigations taking place into the integrity of the Horizon system following allegations that the system had been causing apparent discrepancies? Uh, that at the time I was not aware of at all. At paragraph 22 of your statement, you say that the term bugs, errors, and defects was not in your vocabulary when you worked for the post office, and that the business line was that the horizon system was robust. Who was this business line coming from? Um, towards the end of my uh, work in the post office, so probably 2010 to 2015, I know that there were various programs, uh, it, it was in the media. Um, we were told via our internal communications team, if you were approached by journalists or sub postmasters, <coughs> members of staff, branch managers, that you were to explain that Horizon was uh, robust, there had been reviews and it was fine, and there was a contact number that we should put people onto. So, my understanding is that came from the top, that came from the board. You may not have used the terminology bugs, errors and defects, but you do recall, don't you, there being blue screen issues arising with Horizon? Yes, yes. And that's something you address at paragraph 23 of your statement. And you also recall there being Horizon software releases planned and delivered to rectify transaction issues, is that right? That's right. So those are the questions that I have for Mr. Pegler. Are there questions from anyone else? Uh, there are questions from Ms. Page, sir. Right, all right. Yes, Ms. Page. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pegler, I'd just like to ask you, if I may, about the quick guide that we were looking at, um, the losses and gains quick guide. Perhaps we could have that come back up. It's poll 3008-4076. And if we go to the section 1 where the amount of loss was actually included, uh, which is on page three. Uh, 
that figure there of 2.2 million, how widely circulated had that been? Um, it was certainly a figure known uh, by uh, the business at head office. Um, obviously, it was a major factor on the general manager for Crowns' scorecard. Um, I'm not sure it would have been widely known within the Crown network, which was the purpose of sharing best practice and letting individual managers and staff know that the business was losing this money. So um, certainly within the Crown network and, and above at head office, it was a figure that was known, and with finance as well. And when it was circulated to the Crown network, did it cause a bit of a, a buzz, if you like? I think it, it was a shock to people um, because obviously we've got good branches out there that were incurring very small, if no losses whatsoever. Um, and there were branches where they were hemorrhaging uh, losses. Um, so it was all about getting individual uh, ownership on, on this figure. Uh, and letting know the, the network where we were and what plans were in place to try and address this. Uh, one thing that it reveals is that just like sub-post offices, some Crown offices were struggling to manage what they must have seen as unexplained losses. Uh, potentially, knowing what I know now, that that is a potential, yes. And so uh, the figure there, if sub-postmasters had come to know of it, um, was potentially quite an incendiary thing for them to find out about. Do you, would you see that? Uh, I agree, yes. Um, do you have any knowledge of that document having been, as it were, sort of leaked from Crown offices to sub-postmasters? Is that something that's ever come to your attention? It's never come to my attention, but I would, I would assume that it did um, go get into the Crown Network. Um, I can't recall instances of it happening, but anything that did get into the Crown Network, uh, ultimately you could, you could bet your bottom dollar, I guess, that it would get into the rest of the network. And did you ever hear of anyone... Um, I, 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 I put this because... Uh, Mr. Lee Castleton received a copy of this and was told that he should never show it to anyone um, and that it was something that he should destroy uh, because it was that incendiary. Is that the sort of thing that you've ever heard of? No. Well, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Ms. Page. Is that it, Ms. Price? Yes, sir. It is. We're back on Tuesday at 10 o'clock for John Breeden. Right. Well, before we formally close, Mr. Pegler, thank you very much for providing a witness statement and for answering questions orally this afternoon. I'm grateful to you. Um, and so we'll resume again at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Thank you, sir.